Hi, my name is Professor Dr. Lee Yong Ye, or you can also call me Justin Lee. And I am a professor of medicine and consultant of gastroenterology, hepatology, and internal medicine from School of Medical Sciences, University of Science Malaysia. And today I will talk on diagnosis and treatment of irritable bowel syndrome, or more known as IBS. And this is a condition that is both common and also very uh, relevant to practices of a pharmacist out there. Hence, the learning objective would include the following, providing an overview of IBS, the symptoms and mainstay of treatment. Second would be on the recent evidence-based approaches in diagnosis and treatment. Third objective would be pharmacological and non-pharmacological recommendations by pharmacists, particularly for symptom relief. And finally, when to seek medical advice. Let's talk firstly on the epidemiology and in the worldwide studies on irritable bowel syndrome are largely conducted uh, separate countries, but more recently we do have the Rome Foundation Global Epidemiology Studies involving 33 countries and six continents including Malaysia, where I'm from. And each country, we surveyed 2,000 over uh, participants, and a total of 73,000 adults were recruited worldwide. The bowel disorders would be the most prevalent of all functional GI diseases at a 16.8%, and the prevalence of IBS was 1.6%, higher among women, with an odd ratio of almost two times, and it tends to increase with age. Doctors accounted for 25.4% of participant visits, and this condition is associated with lower health-related quality of life. The common IBS subtypes would be 28.8% of IBS diarrhea, 37.9% of IBS constipation, and the rest belongs to IBS mixed type. The mainstay of treatment is targeting symptoms and also the underlying pathophysiology, especially visceral hypersensitivity. Now, Rome diagnostic criteria for IBS has been around for several iterations. The last iteration was Rome 3, and the most Recent iteration was the room four diagnostic criteria. And this is basically defined as recurrent abdominal pain on average at least one day a week in the past three months associated with two or more of the following criteria. One related to defecation, two associated with change in frequency of stool, associated with change in the form or appearance of stool with a symptom onset at least six months before diagnosis. So the, the two table here provide the differences between the room three and the room four diagnostic criteria. There are other salient features that I would like to mention, which will be important and also provide reasons or why we might need to seek medical advisors. Now, what differentiates IBS from functional constipation or functional diarrhea would be the presence of pain. And the subtype of IBS, whether constipation or diarrhea, would depend on the Bristol stool form that I've shown on the right side of the slide. So if you have a Bristol stool form of type 1 or type 2, then patient would be considered IBS constipation. And if the Bristol stool form is type six or seven, then patient would be considered to have IBS diarrhea. Now within the diagram, bloating or distension is in the center. And this particular symptom is very common among patients with IBS. Other features of IBS would include 
being commonly overlapped with other functional GI disorders. And I did mention about bloating or distension being a common symptom, especially among Asian patients. And milk is often a trigger of symptoms. So if you're unsure of all this, especially if there are presence of organic disorders, then it is good to seek further medical advice from doctors, especially if investigation are needed, including tests like colonoscopy, especially in patients with alarm features that would include weight loss, presence of anemia, family history of GI malignancy, or even nighttime symptoms. Allow me to share a case study. This is a 35-year-old female housewife with underlying salt-losing nephropathy and gastroesophageal reflux disease. She presented with three month history of weekly upper abdominal pain, worse after meal, and associated with constipation and bloating. Usually stool was Bristol stool type 1, and symptoms started more than three years ago. No red flags, her symptoms are causing her to have anxiety symptoms and difficulty to sleep at night. Physical examination was normal and a diagnosis of IBS was made. So the question is, how do I manage her symptoms? First of all, the pain can be effectively managed with the use of antispasmodics. And some of the antispasmodics out there will include alvarin citrate, mabavirin, and pinavirium bromide. So this compound may act differently, slightly differently, but they all act on uh, receptors, for example, calcium influx receptors or sodium channels. And this compound have been studied in randomized control trials, and they have been shown to be useful uh, in a number of um, st uh, studies. And of course, they are they all have use in different sample sizes, but they are definitely shown to be superior than placebo in improving a spastic uh, pain type in patient with IBS. What about constipation? So constipation, again, is a common symptom and the use of laxative is very common uh, even among pharmacists. And laxative can be classified as water binding in stools or stool softener, which tend to lower the surface tension of stools, but they can be antiperistaltic agents. Now, this table shows that some of the most commonly used laxative, their doses, and also the level of evidence as shown in a published paper of mine uh, quite a number of years ago. Floating is common, and this algorithm is one approach on how to manage this patient with bloating in IBS. And there are several reasons, common reasons for bloating, one of which is carbohydrate intolerance. And this can include intolerance to fructose, lactose. And the carbohydrate intolerance can be managed or detected by the, the use of hydrogen breath testing. And clinical trials have supported the effectiveness of using dietary intervention like low FODMAP diet with effectiveness of up to 70% in patients with IBS. Another reason for bloating in IBS would be small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Again, this can be detected with the use of hydrogen breath testing. And obviously, if positive for the test, then antibiotic would be typically prescribed and my favorite would be rifaximin, even 550 milligram three times a day for two weeks. But there are other antibiotic regime uh, being suggested here. If there's a presence of uh, organism, especially metagenomic, methanogenic producing 
organism, then there may be a use of uh, neomycin. Or even that is evident to suggest the use of probiotic in small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. Now, psychologist distress, like in my patient who has anxiety, is also very commonly associated with symptoms in IBS. Studies have shown there is a, a close association between symptoms, including pain and bloating, and also psychological distress that include anxiety, depression, panic disorders, and even sleeping difficulties. So among the most commonly used neuromodulators are the tricyclics and also SSRIs, but very often many of these studies are already old and have a small sample size. And this table illustrates some of the studies that have been shown where tricyclic or SSRI are used to treat IBS. So the, the patient, after three months, uh, she felt better with about 70% of response after the treatment that we have given. But three months later, she complained of persistent watery stools with a Bristol stool of six and sometimes sevens. She so also recall a recent episode of acute gastroenteritis and a diagnosis of post-infectious IBS was made. So what would you do at this juncture? Obviously, any diarrhea would be helpful and any diarrhea can be classified into, firstly, inhib by in inhibition of intestinal transits. And the most commonly used would be opiate uh, like agents, especially loperamides. There's also other agents, for example, 5-HT3 antagonists like alocitron. Others include clonidine and a stomatostatin analog like uh, ultratite. Other anti-diarrhea would be pro absorptive agent like the use of oral rehydration salts um, with, the, with the use of uh, a present of glucose and also alpha-2 agonists. The third antidiarrhea agent act on as an anti secretory agent. This again include stomatostatin analogs and others like bismuth, lithium, zinc, steroid, and so on. And finally, we also have an intraluminal agents, for example, the absorbance in the form of clay or bile acid binding resins and fiber. All these can be used as an intraluminal agent to treat diarrhea. Now, a, a big question is whether there's a role for a probiotics. Now, in recent years, gut microbiome changes has been found to be one of the primary reasons for as a better physiology for irritable bowel syndrome, and obviously modulating the gut microbiome would also be beneficial uh, in IBS. We do have a consensus recommendations uh, by a group of experts from the Malaysian Society of Gastroenterology and Hepatology, and, and this consensus recommendation has a statement suggesting that probiotics are effective and safe in patients with IBS presenting with uh, diarrhea. And in this particular uh, publication, we have also mentioned on how to choose the right probiotics. And this should be guided by the presence of clinic effectiveness in clinical trials. Also, whether it is, uh, has a clear mechanism of action and of course, whether it is accessible and, regulate, and regulated in the countries. When it comes to meta-analysis or, or evidence, the efficacy for single strain probiotic will be better than multiple strains. And for improvement in the global symptoms, a duration of at least two months would be recommended. Other than probiotics, there is also a role for prebiotics, especially in treatment of IBSC. And finally, there are also uh, gut lining agents that allow to protect the gut lining from or the intestinal barrier from damages by the uh, bad bacteria or the um, dysbiosis. And this gut lining agent will include the use of polysaccharides and also protein-based uh, gelling agents. 
So there you go. This is all on irritable bowel syndrome. And I do hope that you find this a taught useful. Thank you very much. Thank you.